And today's title is 60 years of DNA. Okay. So shall we begin? Shall we begin? Yes. So this is my 11th trip to Japan. Uh, my first trip was in uh, 1961. Uh, when I came at the uh, invitation of Dr. Masayasu Nomura, who several years before had been working in my laboratory at Harvard. And uh, Masayasu was a remarkably good scientist. And uh, it then drew to my first uh, appreciation of uh, uh, young Japanese man as a scientist. And uh, we shared much in common in our desire to, you know, always try and do something important. Uh, I greatly admire uh, all that you have accomplished in Japan. And uh, so I always look forward to coming back to Japan and uh, uh, I hope there will be a 12th visit. So I'm uh, now 85, but uh, uh, I still feel young. <laughs> so I hope I will be able to come back. Uh, I thought today I would retell the story of DNA, but uh, do it in context of uh, uh, a little bit about my life before finding the double helix. Then afterwards, sort of explaining uh, what I did after finding the double helix. And uh, now uh, uh, my last comments will be on uh, my trying to uh, still remain a scientist. Uh, and uh, so the... Uh, All right, this is what uh, I look like as a boy, probably uh, 12 years old. Uh, I was consistently smaller than anyone, <laughs> any other boy in my class. And uh, so I, I had a rule to just never get in fights with bigger boys. So uh, I never really got beat up. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, I preferred, uh, you know, to be called a sissy rather than uh, <laughs> get in fights. Uh, but I like to play baseball. And again, I was weak, so uh, they let me be a pitcher. But there, the whole secret was putting spin on balls. <laughs> that is, they don't have to go too fast if they have lots of spin. And uh, now I'm playing tennis again. It's uh, putting as much spin as you can <laughs> on your balls to uh, slow the game down. And uh, another thing as a young boy, which was, you know, made me seem like unadventurous, I never accepted any dares from other boys that might in the slightest way put my life at risk. I was always very cautious of not wanting to hurt myself, because I knew cases where people, you know, either died or were damaged throughout their life because of doing something stupid they shouldn't have done. So I never tried to take risks with uh, my body. And then early on, uh, uh, really through my parents, uh, I was sort of trained, you know, only uh, accept advice that comes from experience uh, uh, as opposed to revelation. That is, uh, you have to reason. And uh, so early on, uh, I, uh, following, I should say, in the footsteps of my father, uh, I abandoned religion of my mother at the age of 11. Uh, she never objected very much because I don't think she was really religious either. But it made life much simpler. <laughs> uh, not believing in things for which there was no reason to believe. Uh, so I am uh, uh, 
I can understand why many people like the rituals of religion and the advice it gives, but uh, not for me. <laughs> and, uh, and another was I was told that uh, never say anything that you don't believe. Uh, we have this word hypocrisy in the English language of, you know, saying one thing but believing something else. And uh, uh, that is, uh, and people do it because they don't want to offend other people. They're trying to please other people. But my general feeling is if you have to be dishonest for someone, you should just avoid them. <laughs> don't get near people that will uh, 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 be offended by the truth. And. Uh, uh, you know, it doesn't mean you go around making remarks that offend other people. Just say nothing is much better than saying something that you don't believe in. And uh, so uh, I think when I say something, people know that I believe it. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's an easy way to move through life if you can avoid offending the wrong people. And sometimes they get into trouble, still. Uh, uh, but then when you were young, uh, I learned never disagree with your teacher. <laughs> uh, and you, know, you don't disagree about arithmetic. It's, <laughs> it's sort of black and white. And so uh, 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 teach teachers with respect. But when you get... Uh, sort of going for a PhD, then you've got to be begin to disagree <laughs> because that's how you uh, establish yourself as an independent person. So if you don't disagree with your teacher later in life, you're in deep trouble. And if you disagree with them early in life, you just get into trouble. <laughs> and so uh, uh, I think it's... Uh, another thing I learned is that... Uh, I never was afraid of admitting I didn't know how to do something and just ask for help. Some people want to bluff and <laughs> make people believe they sort of can do things they can't do. And so they never can ask for help. Whereas I ask for help very fast. It's, it's much simpler getting help than learning how to do something yourself. So uh, it's again, uh, moving through life as fast as you can. And then the, the last advice was have some hero and preferably a young person that you want to be like. <laughs> so uh, we call it a role model. But the role model shouldn't be an old person. It should be maybe someone 20 years older than you or something. Something still that... Uh, so my first heroes were about 40 years in age, roughly. And uh, so, and I should say that on the whole, I had a happy childhood. Uh, that is, I like school. I generally like my teachers. And uh, so it let me move at a, an early age uh, uh, to the University of Chicago when I was... Uh, uh, 15, and uh, I was there at the University of Chicago. Uh, I read the book, What is Life? Uh, when I went to the University of Chicago, I wanted to, before I read the book, I wanted to be, uh, to study birds, to be an ornithologist. But after I read this book, uh, with a nice title, What is Life? And the, and the big question, uh, say, in uh, uh, the 1940s, uh, people say, what is life? Okay, <laughs> what, where did it come from? And uh, Darwin had correctly understood that it evolved, but Darwin could never say what life is. So... This book, written by a very great physicist, one of the greatest uh, theoretical physicists ever to have lived, uh, I mean, 
emphasize the, that the essence of life has to come from uh, information, uh, which tells the, you know, lets a human being grow up like a human, and uh, that this information uh, we knew already from the work of the field of genetics uh, was carried by the chromosomes. But uh, Schrodinger raised the point, well, not only what is the nature of the language, but it must be one that's copied. So how can you copy biological information? So that was sort of the question when I finished the book. That's what I wanted to find out. I wanted to uh, find out how, what, how biological information, genetic information, was expressed in a chemical form. It had to be chemicals that carried the information. And uh, then how did you copy it? Now, when the book was written, Schrodinger had no idea that the genetic material was carried by DNA. Probably like most people at that time, he thought it was a complicated protein molecule. But uh, a year after he wrote the book, experiments were done at the Rockefeller Institute in New York, which showed that you could change heredity uh, through adding pure DNA. This was the famous experiment of Avery and McLeod. And uh, that uh, it, it, and it, it, the answer surprised people because people at that time thought DNA is a repetitive uh, molecule, sort of as interesting as the protein collagen, some structural role in chromosomes, but that it didn't carry information. But the Rockefeller experiment <laughs> said it did. Now, the attitude of most people upon reading an unusual thing is to wait for it to be confirmed that it let someone else confirm the experiment, and then I will think about it, okay? But that's a stupid way to behave, <laughs> because if DNA was the genetic material, it's very, very important. <laughs> so you shouldn't wait for confirmation. <laughs> if, if the experiment looked good, believe it, okay? So what mattered was the quality of the evidence that Avery presented, which said that it carried genetic information. And the evidence was very good. It was not good enough to convince the selectors for the Nobel Prize, and he was considered several times and it was turned down. <laughs> they wanted repetition. <laughs> but in fact, uh, I didn't need that, and I guess that's what made me uh, unique is that I became passionate about DNA before almost anyone else. Now, uh, as a result of reading the book, I decided to go to a, uh, to get my PhD at an institution or, uh, where some of its scientists were interested in the essentially uh, chemical underpinnings of life, in particular the chemical underpinnings of genetics. And I applied to the uh, famous California Institute of Technology at Caltech, where they announced that you know they're bringing biology and chemistry together through their great uh, chemist, Linus Pauling. Uh, but they turned me down. They rejected my application because <laughs> they correctly noted that I had essentially no chemistry in my background. <laughs> so uh, all I had was ecology. <laughs> so I was out in the field, not learning any chemistry. So they probably did the correct thing in turning me down. Uh, but Indiana University got my recommendation and uh, uh, it was not you know, a famous school. Uh, but they thought I looked, you know, uh, my past record was good. And they wrote me that uh, they would give me a, uh, essentially a fellowship and support me, but that not if I studied birds. I had to come to Indiana to uh, essentially do genetics. 
So it turned out actually for a reason I won't go into that Indiana was actually better than Caltech in uh, uh, their geneticists and actually also in their biochemists. So Indiana was very good. Uh, normally Indiana is only famous for one thing. It's basketball teams. So Indiana was famous for basketball, still is famous, always will be famous for basketball, and uh, it's not famous for genetics now, so it was a sort of fluke, but I went there just at the right time, and so uh, I got good advice. And that's one reason why it's so important who your advisor is, who sort of knows uh, scientific gossip, where are the bright young people? and uh, who should you uh, uh, work with. And, but you'll notice there that I was no longer a small person. I had actually grown to be more than six feet tall. So I was very happy that I was, uh, uh, but I still never got into a fight. There's never that. Uh, and then I uh, uh, luckily uh, took a course from Salvador Luria and that's sort of my advice when I was, you know, just off to get a PhD and one choose a young thesis advisor. And the reason is that the younger advisor more likely is working on a new field, something new. Whereas an older professor could be very distinguished, but probably is working on something which is no longer the best thing for a young person. So in Indiana, they had a very, very famous geneticist, in fact, the best in the world, Herman Mueller. But I never thought for a moment I'd work with Mueller, even though he had a Nobel Prize, because the work he was doing was very boring. And no, it was never going to move you toward the chemical nature of the gene. So I wanted to know the chemical nature of the gene, and. Uh, so, and then another thing I learned is that expect young scientists, if they're really good, they sort of have arrogant reputations. That is, uh, people will say they think and know it all and they're unpleasant. And I was told Maria was unpleasant. He wasn't unpleasant to me. He was extremely pleasant. But he would sometimes disagree with his colleagues. And, you know, it would imply that he thought what they were doing is unimportant. <laughs> so that gave Luria a bad reputation among older people, but he was very, very good for me. And uh, I was encouraged to, uh, uh, to take difficult courses because my Chicago record was just uh, <laughs> a lot of easy biology courses. <laughs> So I took a year of, uh, I didn't know any math, I, I took a year of difficult math. I've never used it in my life since. But it gave me some degree of self-confidence that if I had to understand math, uh, I might be able to. In reality, I met Francis Crick, who knew mathematics, so I didn't have to learn any. So I was very lucky. And uh, then uh, it's a, uh, uh, very important that you don't spend any time learning dull facts from the past. <laughs> so I, I annoyed people because I said I will not take a course in histology. Well, why would I want to know about <laughs> the structures of, uh, you know, dead tissue? Oh, it was awful. So I never took it. And uh, they didn't make me take it. So I, I, I never got into a bad fight with my teachers, but I just said, I want to do something important. I don't want to, you know, be a dull biologist. Uh, I didn't choose my thesis objective. I think uh, at that stage in your life, it's terrible to ask a young person to choose his thesis objective. You should give him an objective, and then he can change it. But generally, you don't really know what to do. You're very young. So I was given a, a thesis object, which I changed quite a bit in the course of it. It turned out to be a, an extremely unimportant PhD thesis. 
It had no consequences, no citations. <laughs> but uh, uh, during the course of it, I learned how to th think like a scientist. You know, uh, that was it. You know, do experiments and, and so on. And then I also tried to keep, I would automatically go to all the talks, even on topics I didn't know about, because uh, it, it proves very important to be broad in, in your knowledge. Uh, not deeply broad, but just an appreciation of what's exciting out there in science. And uh, so if you focus only on your thesis, you're likely to be a very dull person later in your life. So you've got to remain broader uh, than your thesis. So uh, my luck was uh, the first summer uh, that uh, Luria went to uh, Cold Spring Harbor, uh, in large part to meet the physicist Max Delbrook, uh, who is uh, uh, the hero of Schrodinger's book. Schrodinger's book had a hero, the Delbrook motto of the gene. So uh, I just thought, uh, you know, the, he's the sort of person I want to be like. And that, uh, there's his wife, and that's Louis. You can see he's probably about uh, 35 years old. And uh, uh, he had, uh, he got the uh, Nobel Prize with uh, Delbrook for essentially establishing uh, these simple bacterial viruses uh, as objects for genetic research. Uh, they shared the price with Alfred Hershey, who did uh, a very uh, more important experiment. Uh, Hershey actually confirmed Avery, but it wasn't until uh, about a year before we found the DNA structure. So if I had waited for someone to confirm Avery's results, I would have not got into DNA in time. I had to accept the initial work. So this is our sort of advice that I put in my uh, uh, book, Boy, Boring People, but uh, the most important is have a big objective. And my objective from the summer of 1949 was to understand DNA. And then uh, another thing was I observed that when you go to seminars, sit in the front row, not in the back. You might as well be, if you sit in the front row, you may ask a question. It's much easier to ask a question if you're in the front row. And we won the speaker here, under hears you. And uh, so, and then you got to ask yourself, when you do experiments, is there anyone who will care about the answer? And Delbro, uh, early on, I was doing some experiment, and he said, that's a stupid thing for you to do. No one will ever care what the answer is. So never do anything unless you have an audience of people who want to know the answer. And... Uh, uh, then uh, science is highly social. Uh, you really have to uh, to talk to other scientists because you have to have someone to put your ideas in front of and get criticism. And if you can't, if you're not social and are afraid of people criticizing you, get out of science. You've got to be prepared for people <laughs> Uh, to say, I don't believe you. And uh, I had uh, real good luck of, of giving a talk in uh, Leo Szilard, a very, very famous physicist who really uh, was the brains, well, was Fermi for building the first atomic reactor in uh, 1942. And he switched into biology afterwards. But Szilard was a very... He automatically, you know, if he couldn't understand your, what you were saying, he'd just tell you to, you know, stop. He didn't want to hear a talk he couldn't understand. And uh, I remember going to one of his talks, and it was awful. 
So he could, he, he was a very good critic, but he could often, uh, he wasn't really a born teacher. But uh, uh, Leo really was, he could think maybe three steps ahead of everyone. You know, if, if this observation is right, it might imply this. If that is right, that implies that and that. And so when he first had the idea of an, an, an atomic chain reaction, it was in 1933 on a street in London. So he immediately went to the British Navy, Navy and patented it as a secret. He knew it was a very important military. So Zillard just, <laughs> he was very, very worldly. And, uh, he was very important in, in giving me self-confidence because Zillard would talk to me. And during the 20s, he had talked to Einstein. So he was, you know, he was clever. Now, uh, I, when I got my PhD, I, went, I wanted to go to Europe because I thought Europe was just much better, you know, in the past, uh, the center of ideas. And uh, so I went to Copenhagen and I would go into it, but it didn't work out. This was a little meeting and the famous physicist Niels Bohr was there. So uh, even though I didn't learn anything in Copenhagen, I was with very bright people in Copenhagen. So it's very important to try and <laughs> be with bright people. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, it gives you the self-confidence, you know. Now I, I want to, <laughs> you know, play tennis. So all I want to do is play tennis with a good tennis player. <laughs> you know, it's more fun. So if you're doing science, it's more fun if you get someone who's at the frontier. So I've been lucky enough always to sort of go to the frontier. Now, uh, it's sort of by accident. I, uh, you know, had done an experiment in Copenhagen, which I hope would say something about DNA. It said nothing. And so I, I went off basically to Italy because I wanted to see Italy as a tourist. I just went to Italy for tourism <laughs> and better food. And uh, so in, in Italy, at Naples, there was a, at the zoological station, there was a small meeting. And it looked very boring, you know. <laughs> Even though it was boring, I went to the talks. And then suddenly the speaker was supposed to speak, didn't speak, and sent his deputy. Uh, this his deputy was named Morris Wilkins, and uh, he put up that x-ray picture. <laughs> and it immediately changed my life, because it said DNA had a very regular structure, which would form crystals, and so there was a precise three-dimensional structure defined. You could have said, well, it's always going to be messy. This says it's not messy. You just, you've got to find the answer. So immediately upon, uh, uh, and this was, and he was uh, then roughly uh, uh, 35, 34 years old. And uh, at the end of the war, he had been in Berkeley working on uh, uh, uranium projects. And then at the end of the war, he was told to read the book, What is Life? So he read the same book that I read, and so he, that led him to taking x-ray photographs of DNA. And he wasn't the first person to do it. He was effectively the second person. Before the war, uh, a crystallographer, uh, Asbury, had taken some pictures of DNA which were not crystalline, and you didn't know how to interpret them. But Wilkins was the first one. So I merely went up to Wilkins afterwards and said, I want to come to London. I don't really, you know, I'm doing something that bores me. I want to do something that won't bore me. Can I join you? And he didn't say anything. 
But he went back to London and said, if I ever show up at his office, don't let me in the door. So my problem was I was probably too enthusiastic. And he sensed that, uh, you know, uh, you know, I seemed to want to find the structure I wasn't trained to. I was a bird washer, et cetera, but I wanted suddenly to move into a new world. Uh, which, uh, where mathematics could be important, I wasn't trained in it. But, uh, so he said no. And then Luria, my PhD thesis advisor, he saved me because he went to a meeting. And I, I would just say, you have to go to scientific meetings where you meet people. And he went to a little meeting at the University of Michigan and met an Englishman, John Kendrew. And said he had this student who was, Louis said I was very bright, but you know, I'd done nothing. And uh, I wanted to go to a crystallography lab, and Kendrew said, uh, have him visit us. So I went, to, as soon as I got that message, I went to Cambridge, England, and they accepted me without any qualification, except that. I was recommended by Luria Delbert. So good people recommended me, and that counted more than did I seemingly have the training. And uh, so and I should say that uh, Wilkins did offer a job to another physicist, Francis Crick. So Francis Crick was looking for what to do after the war. Uh, had been told by the same physicist, Harry Massey, read Schrodinger's book, he read it. And uh, so he met Wilkins. Wilkins wanted to hire him, but then Wilkins' boss, uh, Randall, John Randall, a tiny little nasty man, I, everyone disliked Randall. But he said that, Wilk he, he, that he didn't want Crick in his lab. And the reason was Quick was very talk all the time. So Quick, you know, immediately was sort of a intellectual uh, star, and uh, you could almost say across the bear. Anyway, uh, Quick didn't get a job, and so wasted two years going to the wrong lab in Cambridge, but then moved to the laboratory. The little laboratory it turned out when I arrived there, there were five people, uh, the five people uh, trying to, uh, to work out the three-dimensional shapes of proteins. That was, that was the objective, and so it was. And now, uh, even before I got to Cambridge, I heard that Caltech's great chemist, Linus Pauling had proposed a model for the, uh, uh, the helical conformation of polypeptide chains. I heard that in Geneva. I went, when I got back to Copenhagen, and I read the papers. He published uh, Paul, you know, a spasm of enthusiasm, six papers, seven. It was turned out only one was correct. All the others were wrong. <laughs> but he did publish the right paper. I mean, he got the answer. And uh, so then uh, when I went on my first visit to Cambridge, they told me they had actually, uh, Max Bruce had shown that Poland was right. So Cambridge was in a race with Caltech. Caltech won the race. Uh, but then Cambridge uh, essentially confirmed. So the second observation. Okay, so that's... Uh, so at that time, they, it was sort of obvious if Pauli had thought he had solved the structure of all proteins, he would try and get the structure of nucleic acids. It was sort of inevitable that Pauli would do it. Okay. And th but then I met Francis Quick, who uh, in my book, the opening sentence, I have never seen Francis Quick in a modest mood. Okay. And that really conveyed him. He, he, he always, you know, was bubbling over with ideas and could seemingly explain your results better than you could explain them yourself. So, uh, 
people both admired him and were frightened by him because it's uh, you're always scared that someone else will solve your problem and crick had the uh the wanted to think about other people's results you could say well why didn't he think about his own results well the answer was he wasn't a good experimentalist he didn't know how to get results but if someone else got the results then he could think about them so uh, uh so uh, so francis uh, and at that time he had uh So Francis and I was then you could say uh, a day of meeting each other uh, found each other we had found the first time in our lives we had found someone we could speak to because Francis was the first person who you know seemed to think finding the structure of DNA was going to be the most important objective so he uh, there was no question of in Crick's mind because if Avery was right and we thought if he was right that DNA carried the information it must be at the center of life okay and uh, so we decided that, uh, why not build a model imitate Pauline just and uh, that's all it was so you know a Pauline nucleotide chain and we we're trying to take the regular portion of it and fold it up to a helix. Now, the DNA was the helix which came out of the X-ray DNA. I won't explain why, but it's there. Most people didn't know enough. So it had to be a helix. <laughs> That's it. So we wanted to fold it up, and so we made a three-dimensional model of DNA. And But we made the model that... Uh, it turned out, you know, I learned that Francis was a friend of Wilkins. So Wilkins came out to Sunday lunch. That's where I met him. And we asked Wilkins, how is things going? Do you have any data beyond the x-ray picture I'd seen uh, uh, six months before in Naples? And he said, no, that in reasons which made no sense, uh, his boss, the terrible Professor Randall, had given his problem to a woman, Rosalind Franklin, under the argument that she was doing crystallography. Morris didn't know how to do crystallography, and so she would be the person, better person to do it. This was all wrong. She didn't know any crystallography. She was a bright person, but she didn't know any. And that was part of the reason she lost the race. There's a picture of her. Uh, she... Uh, uh, had a sort of uh, difficult personality <laughs> and uh, seemingly found small talk unpleasant. <laughs> and uh, and then we didn't know it. She came from a very rich family. Whereas Crick's family had once had shoe factories, but they lost all their money. But the Franklins were still rich. <laughs> so uh, uh, she had a very, very good education. Uh, St. Paul's for girls, and then she did a PhD. Uh, she went to Cambridge, and then did a PhD at Cambridge, and then went to Paris. So that, that's Rosa. She was. Uh, uh, I think strong-minded, and uh, but then, so we we made a model. I heard her talk, and <laughs> it's all in the double heat. I had not understood her talk. I came back on the basis of wrong information. Crick and I built a terrible model. It was just wrong in every sense. And, but the people at King's came up and, you know, they were worried we might have done something. But we hadn't done anything. And uh, so the head of the laboratory in Cambridge, uh, Sir Lawrence Bragg, who had found 
Bragg's Law when he was 21 and uh, got the Nobel Prize early in his life. Uh, he said, quick, he said, Francis and I should stop building models and that the building of models for DNA should be done by the people in London who were accumulating the experimental evidence. And the Crick should go back to working on proteins. That left me with nothing to do. But then uh, I actually uh, worked on a tobacco mosaic virus. So I, I found something else to do when we were forbidden to work. And that was, now the only uncertain thing is, what is Linus Pauling? There was no way of telling him not to build models. So we were worried that we were prevented from building models, thinking about it. And so Pauling would win the DNA race. Okay. Uh, Rosalind Franklin seemed absolutely unconcerned. We could not get her. But anyways, that was good. Right. I thought he was a stuffy man. <laughs> but he was a very nice man. And uh, Crick was a difficult cross to bear. And if you get down to it, it was. And uh, so he, 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 you know, just seemed the right thing to do. Uh, essentially, for more than a year, uh, Crick and I didn't try and build any models for DNA. Uh, I, uh, I tried to, you know, change and begin to look English, so I let my hair grow. My hair had been very short. Oh, I go back here. And, and there I'm in Paris. And actually, I'm on my way to Monte Carlo because I want to watch the tennis match. <laughs> so I had become keen about tennis at an early age. So drop me the check one. And, uh, but then, uh, uh, Pauling uh, at first had been not given a U.S. passport because he was thought to be sympathetic to communist ideas. So they wouldn't give him a passport and we thought good because then he will never come to London and won't see the data in Kings. <laughs> and, uh, but then he was given a passport uh, several months later and came at the time of an international congress, and this was the world of uh, uh, microbial genetics. The people who decided to make genetics move faster by working with single cell organisms. So viruses, bacteria, yeast, uh, fungi. This was their sort of world. And uh, so at one end, you can see Alfred Hershey, there's Francois Jacob, almost everyone's in this picture. Uh, Luria is not in the picture because they wouldn't give him a passport. Uh, because, uh, and I think correctly, he had lied about his past. He had to fill out a government form, said he had never met a member of the Communist Party, but I think what? Probably both in France and in uh, uh, he was never prevented from getting government money, but they never let Lurie be on any government committee all his life. So no NIH committee. So uh, it's, uh, anyways, polling came out the last day. And uh, so I talked to him for about an hour, so I said, I, and, but I didn't say we were forbidden from working out because I was, you know, I just indicated I was interested. He said he was interested, but uh, I hoped he was. There was something funny about his alpha helix. It predicted a, a 5.4 angstrom reflection. The reflection was 5.1 observed in proteins. And Crick correctly saw this was due to coil cause. The, the poly peptide chains coiled around each other, and so the, the spacing differed slightly. And uh, so Pauling had come to Cambridge, and Francis had talked to Pauling about the coil coils. And uh, so 
Francis told Pony everything he knew, but Pony didn't tell Crick anything. So Pony then went back to the Caltech, that was uh, sort of in September, and uh, published a paper on coil coils, which came to the same conclusion as Crick. So did he cheat or not cheat? Well, who knows? <laughs> but he wasn't working on DNA. He was working on coil coils. <laughs> and uh, he submitted his paper to, uh, to Nature, but then Nature knew that actually Crick had done it first, and so Crick actually published the paper first. So we were slightly saved by Nature being an English publication. So, so Francis was, you know, beginning to do some things which were important and correct. That is, Francis was becoming Linus Pauling's really true competitor. <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, so I had finished my work on viruses, so I spent that fall working on, I had a theory for bacterial genetics, several chromosomes I was trying to interpret other people's data. It was all wrong, uh, and I published it, but, you know, it was, uh, I discovered it was better to publish a wrong answer than not to publish anything. Because it turned out the reason I was wrong was very complicated. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I wasn't stupid, and I said, <laughs> doing the simplest interpretation wasn't right. Something called HR for our strains. Anyways, I was quite happy during the fall doing bacterial genetics until we get the message through his son, who had come to Cambridge. Uh, Peter Paul came in one day and said, My father has a model for DNA. So, <laughs> so I'm scared. <laughs> so, what can you do? <laughs> we didn't, you know, he didn't say what the model was. Uh, so I went to Switzerland for three weeks and skied. I never skied, so that was essentially, instead of worrying about what Pauling's thing was, I just went to, uh, really it was the first time I'd ever seen, you know, it was their mat. It was just wonderful. But then I come back and <laughs> what is Pauling's manuscript? And then they, uh, we see an advanced copy that he sends to his son. And within 10 minutes of just opening the paper, I knew it was wrong. <laughs> because he proposed three chains, he should have proposed two. And uh, that uh, he used a form of hydrogen bond which couldn't exist. So the world's greatest chemist had made a stupid chemical mistake. He'd written a book, the famous book, The Nature of the Chemical Bond. And he proposes a structure which you know, the bird watcher knows it's wrong. So we, ne we still do not know why Pauling made this mistake. <laughs> and he never even seemed to read the literature to know about the relationships between adenine and thymine and guanine and cytosine. And Pauling had written two papers, one in 1938, and one a talk he gave at Manchester in 1948, which said the genetic material should replicate through making a, a structure of complementarity, so of op, uh, a complementary shape. So if you know the shape of one, you know the shape of the second. And Pauling said, this is how chemistry will allow something to be copied. And he was completely right. But then he wrote a paper in which he seemingly had forgotten he had written something five years before. So as if he had totally lost his memory. Which might have been true. So uh, he was under considerable strain because of the, the pressure from the U.S. government about his uh, sympathy with communism. 
So whether that affected him, I don't know. I, I think it probably isn't the answer. It was something deeper. Anyways, we knew he was wrong. I, I, the next, so I took the paper to the Cambridge chemist and could it be right? He said, no, he's wrong. I took the paper the next day in London and the uh, first person I saw was Rosalind Franklin and then I told her, Pauling has published the wrong structure. And uh, she said, I don't want to read the paper because uh, DNA is not a helix. And I said, you're wrong. Because I knew her arguments. And Craig knew her arguments and knew why she was wrong. But anyway, she was very angry at me because I persisted in saying DNA was a helix. And so then Wilkins sees me in Franklin's office and it comes in and I say, I thought she was going to hit me. And he said, I thought she was going to hit me one time too. Uh, and went into the next room and took out an x-ray picture which had existed for eight months before. Which it was a perfect helix, what they called the B-form of DNA. Rosalind Franklin had this picture for eight months. She, but she wanted to, to work on the crystalline form, which didn't immediately say it was the helix. In fact, she had a, a sort of mock party to celebrate the death of the helix. That was in the middle of the summer of 52, when we were forbidden to work on it. So uh, I went back to Cambridge. That was a, a Friday night. And the next Monday, I, I go and see, and uh, Professor Bragg is, said, can Crick and Watson resume building models of DNA now that Pauling is in the game? And the fact that the people at King's are not building models. So Bragg said yes. So that was roughly the, uh, the 3rd or 4th of February of 1953. And we had the answer in three and a half weeks. And uh, so there was enough evidence in this picture to tell you two chains running in opposite direction, which Franklin didn't use. She, a month, just days after we had got the right answer, she had accepted that this was a helix and it was a two-chain helix, but she didn't ask herself, how do you hold the two chains together through hydrogen bonds? So she had never gone to that. And uh, so I, initially, I was trying to do the wrong thing, <laughs> not far off, uh, to see if you could actually build a structure which like would attract like. And I, I built a structure, but it was really a nasty one. And uh, my chemistry was wrong. But this American chemist, Jerry Donahue, was in the same room with Kirk and I. And he looked at what I was doing and said, you have the structures of, of guanine and thymine wrong. The hydrogens are in the wrong place. So I didn't understand the chemistry, but I said, well, why not accept, you know, change it? and see if I could then build the correct base pairs. And this was what uh, Donahue said these two forms existed. And so I built a model out of the, what he said, the chemically uh, preferred keto forms. That is, quantum chemistry led you to say it would be keto. And uh, on the Saturday morning of, uh, February 28th, 1953, uh, I found the base pairs. Uh, it, it only took me, you know, 20 minutes. So I had been waiting until the laboratory had built uh, metal models. But then with Donahue's things, I made cardboard. I just cut things out of cardboard and uh, put. Yeah, they were just carbon. Anyways, I had the correct answer. Quick comes in, and we realized that uh, they are structure confirms the space group, 
which Rosalind Franklin should have learned, but she didn't. But she could have learned, but she, she had, did learn. And, uh, you know, we just thought uh, it's chemically very plausible, and it explains how DNA is copied. So uh, by the time we went to lunch, uh, we thought we had solved the problem, but we had to build a three-dimensional model. Uh, apparently, Francis went home and never told his wife over the weekend. Yeah, but I went and was with some friends on Sunday night, uh, and I told them we had made a big discovery. Uh, they didn't understand what I was saying, but you know, I'm a, uh, they told their son, who's become a friend, so I know what I did that Sunday night following the base pair. I had dinner with uh, Ronald Dini's. I don't remember what we did Saturday night. I don't remember. I don't remember anything except uh, we went into uh, the pub, the Eagle, and I thought, well, if I'm writing a story up, I should make it sound plausible. So in the story, I say Francis winged into the Eagle and said we had solved the structure of life. Well, in the movie, you know, the pub is filled with people. On Saturday lunch, there's almost no one there. <laughs> so there might have been two or three people. We, you know, the regulars. And we could have said, we've done something interesting. Uh, Francis didn't tell his wife because uh, he just wanted to be reassured we could build it in three dimensions. But we'd done enough work before. We thought we were going to be able to succeed. And... Uh, so the answer came uh, suddenly. Uh, we were, uh, the only thing which sort of kept us from feeling uh, totally elated was we felt we had to tell the people at King's that we had solved their problem. <laughs> and uh, Wilkins and Crick were good friends. So, uh, we, so it was a range of Wilkins would come out and see our model, and Francis and I decided that we would ask Wilkins to be the third author in the paper. Uh, we thought, even though he had found the base pairs, if he had started the whole thing, he, so that he would, uh, so that the paper we were proposing, we, you know, would have been a, a quick lots of Wilkins or whatever <laughs> order we chose, and uh, but. The next day, Wilkins called from London and said uh, he had just learned that Rosalind Franklin also now had an uh, incomplete helical model, and the people in London would publish two separate papers. And uh, so he, he sort of knew he couldn't put his name on the paper, but in his autobiography written when he was about after 80 at age, he said for the rest of his life, he had, had sort of haunted him that it was the biggest mistake of his life that he didn't put his name on the paper. Uh, there was a sort of uh, model. Uh, I don't type. My sister was in Cambridge. She typed the paper. It wasn't very long. And... Uh, you know, Deal Crick did the drawing. And the paper was, uh, that's it. Uh, the famous sentence is, it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have possibly immediately suggests a possible copy mechanism for the genetic material. I have been sort of silly arguing with Francis and we shouldn't even say that. And then Francis would say people were, that we didn't say it because we didn't know it. So, but we did write a second paper that came out a month later, genetical implications, where we go into that detail. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we acknowledge the data from uh, Kings, but you know, we don't specify there what did we know or what we didn't. And so. The first time it was ever discussed what did happen 
was in my book, The Double Helix. There were no notebooks. Francis and I had no notes. All we really finally had is the model. And, uh, of course, the moment my book was written, then people were arguing, should we have, uh, oh, yes, that on the whole, uh, the immediate people, Proust and Kenry and Braggall, knew this was a very big discovery. But most people didn't. They didn't get excited. We weren't asked to give any seminars. In fact, the first public talk was when I came to Cold Spring Harbor in uh, early June. That is uh, three months after the discovery. Bragg had, with Poland, was in a meeting in Brussels that had briefly said that the Cambridge people had a model. And uh, that made the newspapers, but you couldn't you couldn't from the newspapers know what really had happened. So uh, Francis did give a newspaper interview uh, in early June, at the same time we went to Colson Harbor. So it appeared in the English papers then. Uh, time magazine was going to, it was considering an article, and so commissioned a photographer to come to our office and see the model. And uh, these pictures were taken. Time then decided that it was not going to write an article, so no article appeared in time. And the photographer was paid half a pound. <laughs> so he was a student who worked for the paper uh, named Barrington Brown. Now the original printings of these are worth many thousands of dollars, but uh, his payment at the time was uh, uh, two dollars. <laughs> and uh, Cambridge then was sort of had sort of. Uh, You know, in Cambridge, sort of a supreme virtue was uh, being very intelligent and not letting other people know through your conversation. Modesty. So Crick was just the opposite. But in England, you weren't really supposed to ever say you were more important than someone else. Sort of uh, Cambridge, uh, Oxford type behavior. And uh, so, uh, uh, Francis, though, really began to talk about it. I just thought, we've done something so important we shouldn't talk about it, <laughs> which is perverse. <laughs> but uh, that's what uh, uh, happened. And uh, then when I went to Cold Spring Harbor, and there the, the audience was about 200 people, but it was the same world that I had pictured outside of Paris at that day, same sort of group of people. And they all, you know, automatically, or there was no objection to it. Everyone just said it's too pretty to be true, even though it hasn't been confirmed. On the other hand, the fact that no one had confirmed it meant that almost no one were following up its discovery for the, the, for about five years. So, uh, you know, one year there was no citation whatsoever. No one wrote an article which mentioned the double helix, even though it's been found for uh, several years. Uh, we sort of assumed we'd get the Nobel Prize, but it was a great relief when it happened. Uh, which was nine years after the discovery. And the very nice thing was that uh, particularly Lawrence Bragg had uh, written the Swedes saying that Wolken should be a creed. So uh, the three of us are there. And then Brutes and Kenru, who were the thesis, supposed, thesis supervisors for Francis and I, they had by then solved the uh, three-dimensional structures of uh, myoglobin and hemoglobin. So they got the Nobel Prize. 
Now, uh, I'll just say a little about uh, after uh, the main good consequence of finding the double helix was I got a good job, and so I got a, was an assistant professor at Harvard, and uh, that was a very good phase of my life. I began the, they made me teach, and uh, so I think my chief thing is that from the very start, you know, I let the students work for themselves. They had the feeling they were following up their things and my name would never appear on their papers. So essentially, uh, unlike the tr traditions today where uh, you always include the name of the laboratory from which work is done, uh, these students published by themselves. And uh, uh, it, it was quiet for about three years. Uh, I went there, and then uh, we found messenger RNA in uh, 1960. So that was seven years after that. And Sidney Brenner found it independently, and uh, the, the genetic code was first cracked in 61 and completed by 66. Uh, and then that shows me somewhat older. And, uh, uh, you know, for encourage undergraduate research experience. I didn't have that many undergraduates work in my lab, but those that did almost all have become major scientists afterwards. So, uh, you know, when people are, are really good, you know, let them be good as young as possible. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, I had developed a sort of lecture style uh, where, you know, I give your students a straight tip. Just make it as simple as possible. And don't qualify truths. I mean, often textbooks are, give you all the exceptions to discoveries, whereas I just forget the exceptions and figure you'll explain the exceptions if you know there's big truths. So make it uh, simple and... Uh, I published the molecular biology of the gene in 1965. Uh, at the time of the DNA, uh, Francis had been thinking of writing a book, but I think he quickly discovered there was nothing to write yet. Just <laughs> he had the structure, and so you had to have more than 10 years passed before you uh, had it. And by then, Francis had no interest in writing, but he wasn't a teacher. So I had to give lecture notes, and I had lecture notes, and, uh, uh, and I'll just say here, in my career, travel makes your science stronger. As is, you learn things sooner, I guess that's it. And you make friends. You know, if you don't know who someone is, but if you go and visit their lab and you have dinner together and so on, uh, on the whole, it's so nice to have someone to talk to. Because one thing in science is that you discover most people are not interested in what you're doing, and there are only a few, so you got to go out and find them, and then you have someone to talk to. Uh, and uh, then I decided, you know, to write up the DNA story. Francis Crick said no one would be interested in it. Uh, and, uh, but be the first to tell a good story. <laughs> because the, if you have a story and, uh, uh, and no one gave me a large sum of money to write the book. Was, uh, but I, initially it was to be published by Harvard University Press, and I had really serious people, not out for sensations, just, you know, People wanted to publish good books, and uh, and this here: use snappy sentences to open your chapters. The key thing in any chapter is the opening sentence, and then the opening sentence has to, you know, make the first paragraph make you want to read. And then, luckily, the story was simple enough. All my chapters were very short, <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, a small book. Uh, of roughly 30 chapters, 
and I could write a first version of a chapter in about three days, and then it would take, on the average, two weeks before you revised it and a number of times, and then you're finished, and you go on to the next one. Uh, I did all my writing by hand. I've never learned how to type. And so I have the original handwritten version. So I can, you know, correctly point out, uh, I wrote the whole book, <laughs> rather than having, you know, help by a professional writer. And uh, and then here, always remember your intended reader. I wrote the book so it could be read by an intelligent person who knew no science. So I took great care never to have two paragraphs in a row which talk science. <laughs> you know, I'd have a paragraph, then it would be people. So. Uh, it was one of the first of what was called a, a non-fiction novel. So I wrote it like it was a novel, but I was constrained by the truth. <laughs> but I had no notes or anything, so it all came from memory. So uh, when the book came out, I realized that you know, I hadn't remembered some things correctly. But on the whole, I got the story, you know, uh, correctly. Uh, and I read aloud my words. Just, you know, could you read the sentence without gagging? So <laughs> most sentences were, you know, shortened and uh, everything I could do to shorten them. Uh, I worried whether, you know, Francis Crick would like it. And uh, so his, and then he said, he never thought I would you know, write up the story. I said, I'm going to write it up. So, uh, and then he uh, objected, and, but uh, Harvard Press uh, didn't. But anyways, that was the first printing. Uh, uh, almost immediately, uh, the reviews were, you know, 10 favorable reviews for one unfavorable. And the unfavorable ones were written by people who didn't like me or didn't like genetics. <laughs> so I sort of, you know, knew why they didn't like the book. Uh, Francis Crick took about a year to realize the book did not harm him because uh, I hired the, the best lawyer that existed in New York to say, is there anything that would make me sued for libel? And he said, there's not a word of libel in the whole book. So uh, then the publisher hired someone who wanted me to make changes, and uh, at the advice of my lawyer, I made no changes because uh, I did have a, a sentence in the first edition which said that we were worried that, I used the phrase, Linus looked, that Linus Pauling looking like an ass. Well, Linus read this statement and did not like my statement, Linus looking like an ass, so I took it out. So there was nothing, uh, but. That was the word we were using. You know, Paulie had made a mistake, such as, why'd you do it? But nonetheless, you know, he was, uh, uh, Linus was, you know, on a whole uh, very likable person. So we didn't, I didn't want to hurt Linus, but I had to tell the truth. So that, that was more or less the, uh, the thing. Uh, the person who, I knew would be inherently hurt would be Wilkins. Rosalind Franklin died of cancer uh, five years after the discovery. So uh, uh, 
in fact, most people didn't know of her existence until my book. And then uh, it's given rise to uh, plays, and there's a minor medical school named after Roslyn, and her sister has written about a book that we shouldn't use their data. But uh, I think uh, uh, the original title of the book was to be Honest Jim. <laughs> Now, you could say, well, why would I use the title Honest Jim? And uh, the truth is, you only use it if you think someone's dishonest. Uh, and uh, at the beginning of the book, I point out that I had, two years after the discovery, was in Switzerland walking up toward a mountain, uh, and an English party came down. And in the party was one person, Louis Seeds, who had worked with Wilkins' lab. And he recognized me. And he said, how's Honest Jim? And walked on. So clearly, the people at King's were <laughs> uh, not happy with the way I behaved. On the other hand, the people in Cambridge would have been very angry at me <laughs> if we hadn't tried to work on it. So we had to use her data, I think. So I, I've lost uh, no sleep at all worrying about uh, uh, whether we did the wrong thing with regard to Roslyn. And then people say, you should not have used all these nasty words in your book. But I said, this is the way we felt at the time. I'm telling you a story. I'm writing it as a story. So I can't qualify. <laughs> so, Almost everything I wrote about Roslyn in the book, I was just reporting what Morris Wilkins had said. So I, it was my attempt to, to say the correct, you know, the honest thing. Uh, but, you know, uh, I think there, uh, there's no, uh, if you look at it, there's different people with different values will have different conclusions. Uh, but the, uh, and I thought the title of Honest Jim was a good one because there had been uh, uh, the famous Conrad uh, Lord Jim, and then the English writer Kingsley Amos had written an immensely clever book called Lucky Jim. Of course, about an unlucky person. You call him lucky. <laughs> So I just thought, why not Honest Jim? And, uh, but the double helix, uh, the title didn't become controversial. So it was probably a good thing, it came out this way. Uh, I never, never thought the book would become famous <laughs> in the way it has. And uh, so probably objectively, people could, uh, Say, really, I'm a better writer than I am a scientist. Uh, that the science was, you know, pretty straightforward. If you, you know, if you had a manic view on DNA, everything I did was not that complicated. It was just I did it. And uh, so I think Crick and I won because. Uh, uh, we wanted to win more than the other people. We wanted to win. You know, in a sense, uh, it did change the course of our lives. And, and, very, and so I've had a wonderful life, uh, in part because, you know, I made the discovery. Uh, I, I have some other material, but I'll stop. Now, you know, now I'm trying to do science again. And the problem is, and uh, I realized that uh, I like to think about other people's data, not do experiments. <laughs> and because uh, I don't have a lab, so I can think about other people's data. But I don't have Francis to speak to. So <laughs> I had this enormous advantage of, of having someone who thought like I did. So I'm now trying to think like cancer. I've yet to find anyone who thinks like me. So that could be no one thinks like me because I'm wrong, 
or you know, uh, so that, that's where I am. Anyways, I'm very happy. I just uh, had a paper accepted, a theoretical paper accepted for the Lancet uh, on exercise and diabetes. It's an idea, you know. I, re I read some papers, <laughs> so I thought this is important, and. Uh, so for the first time in my life, I had to go through peer review. <laughs> and uh, when you knew the editor of Nature, you didn't worry about uh, <laughs> in the old days. So it was easy. But now, you know, uh, people, but it, it was a good thing. My paper is much better for having been read by intelligent people <laughs> and commented on it. And I hope it will come out in a week or two. And, uh, so it's a completely new interpretation of why people get diabetes, and uh, might be right. So I'm really happy now again being a scientist. Uh, you know, I thought uh, it was fun, uh, you know, organizing meetings in Cold Spring Harbor and going. Well, Mullen does that much better than I do. So you know, I don't. I, I'm not necessary for that. So uh, I may be, you know, more necessary for. Uh, and uh, so I, I now, am, you know, not, people think I'm crazy because I think maybe we almost know enough to cure most cancer. So we've come in an enormous way, and people don't realize how far we've come because they, you know, they haven't used this sort of knowledge to make the right drugs. But I think they're we cured. Uh, so. Uh, uh, I, uh, so, you know, I, I just, uh, as long as I'm living, I want to do something important. I guess that's <laughs> sort of always the way I've been. And uh, so I leave you with this conclusion, just try and use your life to do something that changes the world. Thank you. Thank you so much for the, your inspiring lecture. And so that must be the very uh, educational, for especially the promising years. And so uh, now the time is coming, becoming over. And so happy time is any time very short. So I'm afraid that we, we must go close this yeah. lecture session. Yeah. So I'm getting deaf, so that's why I'm coming close. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Oh, so thank you. Uh, uh, a big, big hand. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So. Good.